so much for having me. Uh, it's getting late in Vienna. It's 5 p.m. Uh, I hope that you're uh, in the mood to learn something about CSS maybe. Uh, anyways, um, as Shep already said, my name is Manuel Matuzovic. Um, I work for the city of Vienna. I'm also one of the organizers of the Web Clerks conference and meetup. And I maintain HTML.dev and front-end bookmarks. If you're interested in HTML and CSS and web accessibility and performance, I would say, um, then you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is mmatuzo, that's double M-A-T-U-Z-O. About four years ago, I began to focus on web accessibility professionally. I read many articles and books. I started to follow experts and I also shared my knowledge online. Um, and um, one of the first articles I wrote was writing CSS with accessibility in mind. And in these articles, I shared the most exciting new things I've learned about web accessibility and CSS. Three years have passed since then. Um, CSS has evolved. I've learned new things and therefore I've decided to write and talk about writing even more CSS with accessibility in mind. And uh, that's why we are here. This talk is divided into four major chapters, progressive enhancement, respecting user preferences, improving accessibility with CSS and CSS and semantics. Let's start with progressive enhancement. I'm a huge fan of progressive enhancement. I strongly believe in this principle because it focuses on content and enhances experiences layer by layer. So instead of loading multiple megabytes of polyfills, compiled JavaScript and CSS workaround onto users, you, we only give browsers code they can handle without additional help. And this usually results in less JavaScript and CSS, better performance and happier users. On the web, this means starting with a strong and resilient foundation, which is a well-structured and semantic HTML document. And then we use CSS to add some design and make some visual improvements. So that's one more layer on our foundation or the first layer you could say. Now, if for some reason CSS doesn't load because the, the network connection is shitty or maybe because the user is using a browser that doesn't support CSS, then it doesn't matter because we have a strong foundation. We have an HTML document that's accessible. We might add another layer, which is JavaScript. We can use it to enhance the experience some more, but we should be careful with using JavaScript because it can potentially, uh, potentially slow down performances, especially on mobile devices. So only use JavaScript when you really need it. Yes, I just said that. Um, <clears throat> Progressive enhancement is really great. It's, it's the key to giving more people access to our content by serving code according to the capabilities of the use, end user's device. And CSS has progressive enhancement at its core. And this is best illustrated by its error handling. When errors occur in CSS, the parser doesn't just stop and throw an error. It uh, will attempt to skip the content it can't interpret before returning to parsing as normal. So for example, if I select all divs in a page and I set the color property to white and I set the CSS is property to amazing and the background property to black, the parser won't throw any errors. It will just skip the line it doesn't understand and apply a white color on a black background. And the parser in this example skips the line uh, in the declaration block um, because the property CSS is doesn't exist. So this is obviously a error but, or a mistake, uh, a mistake I made on purpose. But errors aren't always mistakes. So for example, a browser like Firefox might interpret a pretty new property in CSS without any problems, while the same property looks like an error to Internet Explorer because the property might be newer than Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is pretty old. Um, so here's an example. Here we have a photo of a dog from the side and the dog is looking up and he, uh, the dog is wearing a red party hat with white dots. And uh, there's text wrapping around the rectangle shape of the image. This will work in most browsers because I'm using float left here to, to make the text wrap the image and float has been around for a while. 
We can improve this pattern. It, it, it looks okay, but it could be nicer. Uh, we can use some modern CSS and use the shape outside property to create a custom shape and put it on top of the image. And with this custom shape, uh, this example now looks like this. So you can see that now the text doesn't wrap around the rectangle shape of the image, but around the custom shape that I've defined in CSS. And this custom shape happens to be in the shape of the dog's head and body. So the text is wrapping around the dog now, which is really cool. Shape outside and shape margin um, are well supported. Uh, Legacy Edge, IE, and Opera Mini are some ex ex exceptions. But again, it doesn't matter because they get this very basic version, which is accessible, but just not as fancy as uh, this shape outside version. Here's another example. Um, I've built a pretty large website recently with many components, and some of these components are enhanced with JavaScript. But each component works with and without JavaScript, and that's important because we only serve a minimal amount of JavaScript to users of legacy browsers. And we do that because we made the assumption that if someone is using a really old browser, they are probably also using a really old and slow device. So we don't want to bother them with having to download multiple um, kilobytes of JavaScript and having to parse it. So in order to not ship JavaScript or not as much JavaScript, we have to differentiate between old and new browsers. And here's how we do it. We add a script block to our head element. And in this script block, we set the type, a type attribute to module. And this turns this script block into a JavaScript module. And inside the script block, we select the HTML element and we add a class with the class name JavaScript. And this code is only executed if the browser supports JavaScript modules. So we don't have to write any JavaScript module code with import and export and, and, and all the kind of things you can do. Um, but we turn it, we just turn it uh, into a module. And as you can see here, JavaScript modules are supported by most browsers. So most browsers will get this JavaScript code. There are just some exceptions like Internet Explorer 11, uh, Opera Mini, or UC browser, for example. So this class with the class name JavaScript will only be added to the HTML element if the browser supports JavaScript modules. And here's an example how we use it. Uh, what you can see now is a list of items. Each item consists of a heading and some description. The description can be longer or shorter. And also here you can see two items in this list, but this list might get very long. And at some point it might get hard, might get hard to use this list. So we can um, enhance it or improve it. And uh, one way of uh, improving this pattern is to uh, turn it into an accordion. An accordion is a list of headings usually, and if you click one of the headings, the content will open um, for the respective heading. So the first thing I do is I hide the content, so the accordion, accordion panel, so all the description for each heading, and I only do it if the JavaScript uh, class is present, so only in modern browsers. And then I have to do some more JavaScript stuff. I have to add events and some ARIA attributes to make it accessible. And um, we might even add an icon to show, uh, to give a visual indicator, an additional indicator, if the uh, accordion item is collapsed or not. And this is what most browsers will get. Legacy browsers will just see a simple list and all the other browsers will get this accordion. Also, if for some reason JavaScript doesn't load, everyone gets this list. So uh, we have a great foundation for, for uh, our component here. And what's great about this approach is that um, if a browser supports JavaScript modules, it also supports ES6 syntax. So we don't need ba ba Bubble or anything like this to, co to compile our JavaScript. We can use uh, all the great ES6 syntax stuff um, as it is. So this means no JavaScript for users of legacy browsers and less JavaScript for every, everyone else. This sounds like a win-win situation, I would say. All right, uh, there's more stuff that I can tell you about progressive enhancements, but uh, not today. Um, I've published an article 
this week or last week, I don't know, a few days ago, um, where I have some more examples and also the samples that you just saw. It's online on my website. I will uh, share the link later on. Or actually, if you uh, visit my Twitter profile, I've already shared it a few hours ago. The next topic I want to talk about is respecting user preferences. Operating systems and browsers provide users with all kinds of options to customize their browsing experience. And it's our job to respect these preferences in our style sheets. And there are many things that we have to take care of and I'm going to show you two, um, at least today. The first thing and one of the most fundamental things that we should take care of is font size. We should respect the font size our user have chosen in their uh, browser settings. The default font size in most browsers is 16 pixels, but it can be changed to a lower or higher value in the browser preferences. So here, for example, uh, I'm in Firefox, and if a user opens their preferences, they can change the default font size for running text, for example, to 20 pixels. And when we write CSS, we should make sure that uh, the base font size for running text doesn't get lower than that value. And we can do that by using relative units instead of absolute units. The problem with absolute units like pixels is that um, if we define, for, for example, a font size of 18 pixels uh, on the body element and our user sets their base font size in their browser to 20 pixels, we overwrite their option. So our font size of 18 pixels overrides their uh, base font size. I'm not talking about the minimum font size in the browser settings, but the base font size. Here's an example. Uh, I'm showing a screen recording right now. On the left-hand side of the video, you can see browser preferences in Firefox. And on the right-hand side, there is a paragraph, a basic paragraph, and I've set the font size to 18 pixels. As I'm changing the font size on the left side, nothing happens on the right because Changing the font size to 30 will do nothing if I've decided to set the font size on the body to a fixed value like 18 pixels. If we use relative units like RAM instead, we can still define our preferred font size, but we can also respect user preferences. One RAM is relative to the root font size, which as already mentioned is uh, 16 pixels in most browsers. So if we want to turn uh, a pixel value into RAM, we have to convert it. And uh, here's how, how you can do it. You take the target font size, which in uh, this example here is 18 pixels. You divide it by the default base font size, which is 16. And the value you get is the RAM value that you want to use. So 1.125 RAM. Even now, instead of using 18 pixels, use this RAM value on our body element, you can see that the paragraph still looks the same. So we've defined the font size in RAM, but the rendered font size is 18 pixels. And if I now change the font size in my settings from 16 to 20, you can see how the font size in my document grows with the uh, font setting in the browser. which is way more respectful towards users and, and much nicer and much more flexible. All right, that's the first thing I want, wanted to talk about uh, when it comes to respecting user preferences. And the second thing is motion and animation. There are many talks about motion and animation on the web and also about the prefers reduced motion media query. I don't want to talk too much about the basics of animation on the web. Um, because there are many other talks and articles and uh, also by way smarter people who can explain things better. But there are two things that I want to mention. The first thing is there is an article called Accessibility for Vestibular Disorders, How My Temporary Disability Changed My Perspective by Facundo Corradini. And I'm simply mentioning this article just to recommend it, read it. Um, it blew my mind because it was the first time that I read about the negative side effects of animations on the web by someone who experienced it, experienced it firsthand. And also Facundo is a developer. So he describes which patterns and uh, effects were especially bad and made him feel dizzy and sick. 
Here's a quote from the article. He says, really, there are no words to describe just how bad a simple parallax effect, scroll jacking, or even background attachment fixed would make me feel. I would rather jump on one of those 20G centrifuges astronauts use than look at a website with parallax scrolling. So animations on the web aren't just annoying sometimes, but they can also cause, cause nausea, dizziness, and headaches in some people. For people with vestibular disorders, it may even cause pain and make them feel so bad that they have to stop using the computer, needing time to recover. Facundo also describes how distracting animations can be when you're having a time focusing itself. He says, the extreme conscious focused effort it took to read would make it such that anything moving on the screen would instantly break my focus and force me to start the paragraph all over. And I mean anything. I can highly recommend this article. Check it out. It's on uh, a list apart. I've tweeted it about two or three hours ago. And it just outlines very well how important it is to use animations on the web cautiously. And this brings me to the second thing in this chapter that I want to talk about. It's how we use uh, animation on the web. Here's a simple example. So usually we have some kind of animation in CSS, for example, a keyframe animation. Um, on the screen is now a, a keyframe animation. Let's call it function, doesn't matter. And uh, what it does is it moves an item from one part of the screen to the other. And then we select an element, for example, here an image, we use the animation property and we apply this um, keyframe animation. And then hopefully we're using the prefers reduced motion uh, media feature and check if it's set to reduce. So this evaluates to true if the user has chosen in the operating systems to only um, receive reduced motion. And then we could select the items where we've set the animation again and remove it. I'm going to show an animation now for six seconds where an item moves from one side of the screen to the other. So if you have no preference for reduced motion, you will see now a GIF of someone moonwalking from one side of the screen to the other. If you've chosen in your operating system that you don't want to see uh, animation or that you want reduced uh, motion actually, then you will just see a GIF of someone moonwalking in place. You could even take this one step further and use a combination of the prefers reduced motion media query and the picture element and replace the GIF with a JPEG if the user has chosen to uh, use reduced motion. But you don't always have to remove uh, motion completely. Sometimes it's also fine if you just reduce it. Val had recently published an article on Smashing Magazine and um, she talks about motion and how, how, uh, how bad it can be and what we should do and how we can uh, make sure that um, our users don't get sick. And she also says that we should try to determine the most, appropriate, the most appropriate reduced motion condition for potentially triggering effects. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we have to remove it completely. I've tweeted this uh, article as well, so you can check it out. So in summary, we usually have some kind of animation, for example, a transition or the animation property. Then we use the prefers reduced motion media query. We check if it's set to reduce. And then for example, we use the universal selector and remove all um, animations and transitions. This is what you would, would usually find in an article or talk about the prefers reduced motion property. Now, this is fine, it's okay. The problem with this approach is that uh, the prefers reduced motion property was only, uh, media feature, sorry, was only introduced a few years ago. So it's not supported by all browsers, which means that if we set inf animations first and the browser doesn't support this media feature, users will get animation no matter what. And browser support, of course, is really good, but in IE 11, it's not supported. So users of IE, for example, would always see animation. And this is why uh, Patrick H. Lauke, Patrick H. Lauke, uh, recommends a defensive prefers reduced motion use where animations only run in browsers that support the media feature and only if users have expressed no preference. So instead of checking prefers reduced motion reduce, you check for prefers reduced motion no preference, 
which, mean, which means this will only evaluate to true if you have no, no preference in your operating system for uh, reduced motion. And then in this block, we apply animations. And this is much nicer because it also takes uh, progressive enhancement one step further. We start with a CSS file that has no animations and only if the browser supports the media feature and if the user has no preference, we apply animations. I like this because it's uh, way more uh, respectful. Here's how, how I'm using it on a, a website. We're checking if the prefers reduced motion value is no preference. And if this is the case, we select the HTML element and we set scroll behavior to smooth. Here's an example. Here we have a list of uh, anchor links in a, and this list is followed by a heading or some headings and some paragraphs. And if I click one of the links, you can see how the page scrolls to the respective anchor. And there is a smooth scrolling animation when you click an anchor. Now, if I access my operating system preferences here on macOS, some preferences, then this, uh, accessibility and uh, display, and I set in a check reduce motion, you can see how there is no transition anymore. So now you have the default uh, um, behavior uh, you usually get for anchoring. So it jumps directly to the anchor without any animation. And this is what users will get if they have set this setting or if they're using a browser that does not support the reduced, prefers reduced motion media feature. Again, there's more that I can tell you, but uh, not today. I'm going to publish an article soon, uh, part two of this series of articles, where I will write more about respecting user preferences. All right, now let's talk about improving accessibility with CSS. Um, CSS is quite powerful and uh, it's, it's a range of selectors provide us with many different ways of improving user interfaces and also testing their quality. So I'm going to show you some examples now and the following examples don't just serve as snippets that you can copy and paste and use in your CSS files, but they're also intended to inspire you to take advantage of the language and use um, CSS to the fullest and, and use its vari variety of selectors and functions and so on. I'm a huge fan of attribute selectors because they're really powerful. You can do all kinds of interesting things with attribute selectors. Here are some examples. So let's say I have a simple link, a link that points to a, an, an HTML file and the link text is our menu. And then I have another link, um, also with the link text, our menu, but this link points to a PDF file and it also has a download attribute. Now, visually, they're the same. There is no difference between the first and the second link. But the first link points me to a new site. It navigates to a new page. And the second link opens a download dialog and uh, prompts me with an option to download the file. And this may be confusing to some users. They might not expect a download dialog to pop up when they click a link. So we can try to differentiate between normal links and download links. And one way of doing that is to use an attribute selector and select all links with the download attributes. And then we use a pseudo element to add an icon right next to the link text. So the first link still looks the same. And the second link now shows a download icon next to the link text. This is nice because now we, have a di we are dif differentiating between normal links and download links but there's, there may be several issues. First one is users might not understand the purpose of the icon. And honestly, I don't know how to solve this. You probably have to use to do, to do some user testing and then you might find out if people understand uh, what this icons me icon means. And the second issue is that this is not screen reader accessible because the icon is just a background image. There is no alt text. There's no information for screen readers that we've uh, added a, an, an icon here. Scott Winkle, a great guy, follow him on Twitter, follow his blog. Uh, he writes all kinds of awesome stuff. He wrote an article called Tips on Making Sure Hidden Content is Accessible or Not. And in this article, he describes a technique that, he, that he's using. 
and he creates a so-called screen reader sprite sheet. This is basically just a hidden diff and this diff contains some spans with IDs and in each span you have a, a, a message that can be referenced somewhere else in the page. So this div is hidden, it contains messages with IDs. If we want to reference one of the messages, this is what we have to do. Um, here's an example link, uh, a link that points to Michelle Barker's website and the link text is also Michelle Barker's website. And if I use a screen reader, it might announce something like Michelle Barker's website link. If I want to improve this link, I can use the aria described by attribute and as the value, I take the ID of the message I want to reference. And now a screen reader might read something like Michelle Barger's website opens an, ex an external site link. So we've added information to this link. This is great. Now we, we are differentiating between normal links and external links and uh, maybe links that open in a new window for screen reader users, but this is not accessible to uh, sighted users. Again, we can use attribute selectors. We can select, for example, the area described by uh, attribute with a specific value because we know that IDs are unique and we know which ID is doing what. Um, if you don't want to use that, you could use another selector. I think these kinds of selectors are called uh, substring matching attribute selectors. And um, here I'm checking if the value of the href attribute starts with HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash, then, then I know that it's an external link and I can uh, show an external link icon or do whatever I want. So the caret equals means an attribute value starts with. All right. One more thing. Um, this is one of my favorites, testing accessibility with CSS. At work, we have a file called Ellie Tests CSS, and we inclu include it in our development environment. And this CSS file contains some utility classes. Here's an example. We add this class to our HTML element if we uh, want to test websites with the keyboard only. And we add this uh, class only to make it harder for us to use a mouse. What this class does is it removes the cursor from all items and it also prevents clicking and, and, and hovering and so on. And we do this because sometimes when you're testing with the keyboard, you are tempted to use a mouse, you know, just, just quickly move the focus somewhere else. And with this class in place, that's not possible there because there is no cursor, we don't see it and just clicking just doesn't work. So that's, that's a nice uh, utility class. Another class is this one. Uh, we use it to put websites in a grayscale mode. Again, we add it to the HTML element. And in this class, we use the filter property and set grayscale to 100%. And we do this to check if parts of our websites, websites um, communicate information with color only. So for example, here's an, uh, a screenshot with this CSS property active of the meter page. And unfortunately you, you, unfortunately, you don't see the mouse cursor, but I'm actually hovering over the sign up link. And there's no difference be between login and sign up because they're only changing the color on hover. So for me, there's no way of uh, knowing that uh, this, this element is active or that I'm hovering over this element. So please don't use color alone to communicate information and also please underline your links. Please, please, please. Okay, there are more uh, classes. This file is online on GitHub. Uh, you can check it out. Um, yeah. Another thing we do is to debug accessibility with CSS. Now, this, this uh, testing CSS file and also this debugging, um, those debugging examples that I'm going to show you are no replacement for proper testing. So they're no replacement for tools like X or Wave, but they're a nice way of um, getting immediate feedback because if I use CSS to debug or to test, I don't have to run a tool uh, and I don't have to deploy the website. I see it immediately while I'm uh, developing. So we don't just have this Ellie tests file. We also have a debugging uh, the CSS file and there we do some interesting tests. For example, here we select 
the HTML element and only if it has no language attributes. So we, we use this to check if there is a language attribute on the HTML elements. And this is important. Uh, the language attribute on the HTML element defines the natural language of the page. And screen readers might use this attribute to determine the, wide, the, the right uh, voice profile for the page. So, for example, if you are on a page where text is written in English and you've set the language to German, the screen reader might use a uh, German voice profile and it, will, it would sound a little bit like me, like I'm talking, because you can hear this strong Austrian accent when I'm talking. And you really don't want that. You want to, to hear a nice British or American uh, uh, accent when, when you're reading a, an English page. What we are doing on top of that is also we're checking if the language attribute is empty because there the, the must be a value and we're checking if the value is a, an empty space. And the last thing we're checking is we're checking if it's English. So if the value is English. So for example, if you are uh, working on a German website, you would want to change this selector to check for DE or if you're on a French website, FR. So if the language is not English, for example, we show a red border around the HTML element. If the language attribute is missing, again, red border. And I'm using the language pseudo class here because um, it's really cool because it um, evaluates to true not just if the value of the language attribute is EN, but also if it's ENGB or ENUS. So it also takes variations of the language into account. This is really cool. Here's another uh, debugging test we do. It's not bulletproof, I know, I'm making some assumptions here, but it's good enough to catch low hanging fruits. So what I do is I select all items with a class uh, name button or BTN. Uh, these are quite common class names for real buttons or wannabe buttons. And then I'm checking if it's not a button. So if there's an element that has the class button or BTN and it's not a real HTML5 button element, I show a red outline around the button. And you can extend this and check if it's not a type button or not a type submit or type reset or type image, then you show this uh, outline. So if there is a, 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 a div button, so a div with the class button in my document, it will show a red outline. Of course, if the buttons, the fake div buttons don't have one of these classes or uh, no class, it won't work. But uh, again, it's uh, a nice way of checking common errors and common classes. I'm going to skip this one. Um, another test we're doing is we're checking if there are links that contain buttons or if there are button elements that contain links. Uh, we don't want that. No one wants that. Don't do that. Don't nest links inside buttons. And if this is the case, again, we show a, a red border uh, to... to, to um, signalize that this is wrong. So if you're not thinking, okay, why in the name of Sir Tim Berners-Lee would anyone put a link in a button? I don't know, I can tell you, but people do that. Uh, believe me, uh, part of my job, and as Shep mentioned that I'm a consultant, is auditing websites. So uh, people pay me money to look at their websites and tell them that they're using divs as buttons or nesting links inside buttons. I don't know, it happens. And because it happens, I created this website. It's called html.dev. And on this website, we uh, collect real life bad practices that we find on websites. So bad practices in HTML. And um, we publish them, of course, without shaming or blaming anyone, anyone. So it's anonymous. And we explain what's bad about it. And we also provide alternative uh, solutions uh, to these patterns. Of course, this is open source. It's on GitHub. Check it out. Uh, if you find something in the, in the wild that's really, really bad, then yes, please uh, fork the repo and uh, create a submission. If forking is not your thing or if you're afraid that uh, it's not right or people wouldn't be interested in seeing your bad codes that you found, then just contact me on Twitter and uh, we can uh, work on it together and or I will just tell you um, if it fits or if we've already covered it. All right, and if you're into CSS debugging or CSS uh, testing, I can recommend a project on GitHub called Alex. 
so le.css, but pronounced Alex. And um, they have many more uh, selectors and tests in their repository here and way smarter tests than my tests. And um, you can spend the whole day just reading the CSS files and finding out why they're testing and what they're testing and how they're doing it. So it's really nice. So even if you're not into accessibility, uh, you can learn a lot just by how they're using selectors and, and um, about general web development, front development, I would say. All right, the last chapter for the day. Semantic HTML is important. There are many reasons why. I've already mentioned some uh, reasons in uh, the first chapter in progressive enhancement. And another reason is that screen readers, so um, the software people use to uh, read text on a page, for example, blind people, they depend on semantic HTML. So they, will, they would announce elements differently according to their role and attributes and so on. So I've already mentioned it uh, quite a few times. A div is not just as good as a button. There's a huge difference. A div is nothing and a button is a proper button and it has some extra events and, and states and so on. And I assume that HTML is the only language that affects semantics, but I was proven wrong. Uh, CSS may also affect semantics or at least the way screen readers pronounce um, text. Here are some examples. So here I'm in Chrome and I'm inspecting a simple list. So I'm clicking the list and now I'm switching to the accessibility pane and you can see that the, the list is a role of list and the list contains some child items with a role of list item. If I switch to the styles pane back and I now set display to contents and I switch back to the accessibility pane, you can see that the accessibility node is not exposed anymore. So the list is not in the accessibility tree anymore. So the accessibility tree is basically a simplified version of the DOM uh, for assistive technology like screen readers, for example. So basically what this means is that if you use display contents on an element, it doesn't exist anymore for screen readers. It's like using display none. Display contents is uh, fairly new. It's really cool. You can use it for CSS resets, or you can, in some cases, you can use it as a replacement for uh, subgrid before support gets better, but uh, don't use it, uh, at least for now, because this bug is still present in Chrome. Um, so yeah, please don't use it, or at least wait a little bit before you use it. Okay, here's another example. Um, some screen readers will spell out words, so letter by letter, if you write a word in all caps. So if you write show in all caps, a screen reader will announce S-H-O-W. It won't just read the, the word. Some screen readers might even do that if you're writing the word in normal case and you're using text transform uppercase in CSS. So this might happen as well in some screen readers. And other screen readers will only spell out a word that's written in all caps if you spell it wrong. And I stumbled upon this in an, during an audit. So in one of those cases where I had to check the accessibility for websites, there was a button and there was hidden text and the button text was show sub navigation. And apparently, you don't write sub navigation as one word, you write sub dash navigation. And um, here I'm in Talkback, that's a screen reader on Android, that's uh, on Android by default, and I have three examples. So the first one says show sub navigation, it's written in all caps. The second one is a normal case, and the third one is a normal case, but with text transform uppercase. And this is what it sounds like. One, show S U B N A V I G A T I O N. Two, show sub navigation. Three, show S U B N A V I G A T I O N. So you can hear that Talkback reads the word show and then it spells the word sub navigation, but only if it's written in all caps or if text transform is uh, set to uppercase. And that's because it's uh, spelled wrong. I guess at least that, it's, that this is the reason. I assume that. Okay. Another example is here. Let's say you want to create a custom checkbox. There are different ways of creating custom checkboxes. Uh, a quite popular uh, way that you will find in many articles is to hide the native checkbox and use a pseudo element to create a pseudo element on the label to create a fake checkbox. And then you can use all the CSS you want uh, to style your checkbox. 
This is fine, you can do that, why not? Uh, but it's just important how you hide the checkbox. Hiding using display none is a bad idea. Because display none, again, just like display contents, removes an item from the accessibility tree, making it inaccessible to screen reader users. Here's a demo, I'm in Safari, I'm using the uh, default screen reader on macOS voiceover, and there are two checkboxes, they look the same. The first one is accessible and the second is not. And here's what it sounds like. Heading level one, checkbox demo. You are correct, this checkbox is accessible. Untick, tick box, tick. This checkbox is accessible, tick box. Untick, this checkbox is accessible, tick box. This checkbox is, this checkbox is not accessible. You are, checkbox. You are currently on a is. This checkbox is not accessible. So in the first checkbox, the screen reader announces the label of the checkbox. It announces also the role. So it says tick box that changed recently. Um, so it's a checkbox basically. And it also announces the state. So if I click the checkbox, it will tell me the new state. It will tell me that it's ticked. In the second checkbox, it just read the label. And when I clicked it, for some reason, the focus moved to, to a second word. I don't know what happened there. So in the second checkbox, I'm using display none, which is bad. And in the first, checkbox, I'm using a combination of properties in CSS to hide the element visually while still making sure that it's accessible uh, to screen reader users. So it's still in the document, but it's just hidden, hidden using clip path and position absolute and uh, all kinds of properties. All right, here's another example. Um, here's a table and it's a really basic table. I know there should be a T head and a T body and summary and whatever, but there wasn't just wasn't enough space on, on these slides. And this is also why the formatting is so uh, strange. But I've discovered that you can uh, actually design tables in HTML and make them look like tables. So this is really cool. All right, so this is a table with three rows and the first row contains some header headings, name, age, and location. And the two rows um, contain content, Sandra 24, Austria, and Mike 42, USA. And I have two versions of this table. The first one is untouched. So I didn't change anything except for some spacing and uh, borders. So you see the, the, the table better. And in the second example, I've changed uh, one line of CSS. And here is what it sounds like. Table demo heading level one. Default heading level two. Table with three rows and three columns. Row one, column one name. Column two H. Column three location. Row two Austria. Row three USA. H column two forty two. Display. Flex heading level two. Table with one rows and one columns. Row one, column one name. Edge of table. Edge of table, edge of table, edge of table. So in the first table, you can hear how NVDA, this is a open, open source, yeah? Uh, no, 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 it's not open source, but it's free. Uh, a free uh, screen reader for uh, Windows, how it announces table with three rows and three columns which is correct, there are three rows, there are three columns. And then I can use the arrow keys to jump from one cell to another. So I can freely navigate in this table, which is really cool. And uh, the second table says table with one row and one column, which is wrong. And if I try to use the arrow keys, it just says edge of table, edge of table. And the only difference between the first table and the second table is this. I've selected all table rows and I set display to flex. That's it. So with this, not just the layout changes, but also the accessibility information of each row is altered. This happens in NVDA uh, and Firefox. NVDA with Chrome works just fine. And this is not uh, something that's specific to Flexbox. If you set it to block or grid or whatever, it will happen as well. There's a fantastic article by Adrian Rosselli uh, called Table CSS Display Properties and ARIA, where he writes about this um, issue and he also uh, explains some more and he does many demos and also constantly updates this article. So if at some point this changes in Firefox with NVDA, I'm sure he's going to update uh, this post. If you are into accessibility or if you want to learn about accessibility, I can highly recommend uh, Adrian's website, follow him on Twitter, uh, read his blog. He, he, he knows a lot and he writes a lot. He's a great guy. 
Okay, uh, one more, no, two or three more examples actually. Um, here's a list, a basic unordered list. If I use voiceover again on Safari, this is uh, how it sounds like. List three items. Bullet, element one, one bullet, element two, two bullet, element three, 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 and a list. So voiceover announces that it's a list and that it contains three items and for every item it reads the label and it says uh, one or three two or three and so on if i now select this list and i uh, set list style type to none there are no bullets anymore and this is how it sounds like element one, element two, element three. so voiceover just announces the labels element one element two element three and this is not a bug this is on purpose because at some point we decided that everything should be a list because you know anything could be a list and uh, i was also one of these developers a few years ago um, so basically everything was a list or a heading or a paragraph and the developers of voiceover and safari referred to this as listitis so something like a list disease because everything was a list and um, they thought okay if you are removing the visible indication of the list, there is no indication to sighted users and there shouldn't be to screen reader users. So if you remove the bullets, it's not a list anymore. Which makes sense, I guess. Um, there is an article called Fixing Lists by Scott O'Hara where he explains this and also why they did it, so their, their intent. And he also explains how you can use list style type none uh, while making this list still accessible. So you can bring back the, 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 the role of the list by using uh, ARIA attributes. He explains this, check it out. Um, I've tweeted both links recently and um, I can also highly recommend Scott's website. He's also one of the very talented accessibility guys. He knows a lot. That's it. Thank you so much for uh, listening. I hope that you've learned something new. I hope that you've enjoyed this talk. Uh, CSS is an incredibly beautiful and powerful language. I love it. Um, take advantage of as many features as possible. Uh, use modern CSS, create amazing experiences, but please just make sure that you do it with accessibility in mind. Thank you so much. Um, here's a link to my website, matuso.at, and my Twitter handle is mmatuso. If you have any questions or feedback or anything, uh, feel free to ask whatever you want. Thank you.